So folks, one of the things I note frequently is that people like Merrick Garland don't talk very much. Pretty silent, but always listening. Always in the background gathering info. And that's the worst matchup for a big fat loudmouth like old Donnie. But also people around him, in his movement, in his orbit, who usually themselves are not very bright and not very good at staying quiet. And so in a sort of shocking way, in a surprising way, Garland scored two big victories over Donald Trump today by gathering critical info that's while that while concerning the info itself is very concerning is nonetheless very useful for Garland as we go forward I want you to listen to this clip and then we're also going to get into some stuff about how Cannon's role in all of this Judge Cannon's role in all of this has been blown wide open with a shocking look into her and the process around her you're, it's like Sophie's Choice, picking which one of you to go first, but I will just go in order. Um, Frank Ficklizzi, you first. Yeah, look, what's developing here is, a, here is a crisis of credibility. And I fear that the senior most leaders at FBI and even at other intel agencies, as we continue to learn, like every day, who knew what when, and that it was a lot more than we thought they knew at the time preceding January 6th, I fear that those leaders are not grasping the gravity of this moment in terms of the future of their organizations. What I mean by this is it's time for complete transparency. It's time to come out and say, we dropped this ball and here's why. But when we have Chris Ray, for example, six months after January 6th, testifying on the Hill that they lacked specific intelligence indicating violence or a breach of the Capitol, when we have just days after January 6th, the head of the Washington field office calling a press conference saying he lacked specific intelligence about violence in the Capitol. Something's very wrong because we're just learning, even in the last 24 hours, about new material obtained from the January 6th committee from Secret Service that they knew that the FBI was briefing the law enforcement community, even regular briefings in the days preceding January 6th, and even every two hours the night before January 6th. So which is it? You lack specificity or you had the intelligence to do something and somehow it didn't happen. And I think it's going way up the chain here, even to involve political suppression of anybody who might have wanted to take further actions to secure the Capitol. Those are the questions that need to be answered, and they need to be answered now, not waiting for the committee to release a thousand page report months from now. Do you agree, Frank Figlizzi, with the assessment from these two former senior FBI officials that Christopher Wray is to blame for creating a vacuum, for not articulating a clear vision? I think if you watch his testimony, and I, look, people know I, I've written a book called The FBI Way. I, every time he testifies, I pay close attention. I look for fulsome, responsive answers, and I don't yet see that happening. So if the laws need to be changed, if the attorney general guidelines on conducting domestic terror investigations need to be changed, come out and say it. But he hasn't said it. If they dropped the ball because somebody at the White House told them, don't take action to enhance security at the Capitol, don't pound your fist on the table for Capitol Police to do something, then say it. But we, we're not hearing it yet, and it's eroding the credibility of the, of the institution. That's why so many agents are saying this is painful. We can't take the beating every day and appear to be political. But yet they've become politicized in his criticism. And it's important to know that you have three people on right now who care deeply about the FBI and the institution. Um, and I hate to put more work on Merrick Garland and Lisa Monica's plate. But, you know, the FBI is just many people don't realize that. But it, they report directly into the deputy attorney general and the attorney general and Chris Ray had a very different response to the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer, where they were all over it. The deputy attorney, the deputy director, excuse me, of the FBI said this was the most significant domestic terrorism event facing the Bureau. That was the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, and yet, when January 6th happened, the FBI really was asleep at the switch. And it wasn't an intelligence failure. It was a failure to act on the intelligence that they had. And I find that Chris Ray's testimony was exactly what you do not want from public officials. It lacked 
candor and fulsomeness in saying what exactly they knew and where their failures were. How do you expect an institution to become better and to make sure this doesn't happen again if you don't have leaders who are going to be willing to acknowledge what went wrong and to figure out how to fix it? I do think that it is a huge problem that Chris Ray is, I think, really not showing the correct leadership. Um, and that means that it really falls to the attorney general and the deputy attorney general to hold him to account for that failure. So what that shows there is that there are a lot of sympathies before, during, and maybe even after J6 with regard to a lot of officials. We've talked about Secret Service. This mentions FBI. That's terrible on the front of it. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The fact that some of these people have sympathies with the J6 folks isn't good. And as you know, the DOJ oversees the FBI. And so that on its face, not great for Garland. But this is critical. The fact that he now knows this, because if he has this... If we have this info, he has this info. He almost certainly had this info weeks, if not months before we had this info, if we're being honest. If it's in the public, the people that are investigating know it. And the fact that he knows this is big for two reasons. One, if you know there are people with, on your inside that are sympathetic to the thugs, you can potentially find those people and isolate them. But also, if some of those people were so sympathetic that they were making direct links and ties to the thugs, or to the Trump movement, then you can further build your case of conspiracy, that you can connect Donald Trump to his own people, to the Stop to Steal people, to the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys, but maybe also even officials within the government, within Secret Service and maybe even within the FBI that were sympathetic. And so while that's terrifying, let's, let's be real, it's terrifying, if you're looking to make a real case for conspiracy, that's one of the things you would look at is official connections like that between Trump and other people willing and able to either do violence or at least aid and abet and excuse violence. And then we have to get in the canon because there was a shock of in shocking investigative report into how she became the Trump judge. The way Donald Trump did it was by breaking the rules as they're understood today and filing the lawsuit in a totally inappropriate fashion. And by so doing, he was able to get at Cannon as a judge. I want to read you some reporting. It says, Law Professor Carl Tobias of the University of Richmond admitted something seems off kilter about the whole sequence of events, stating, it's clearly related. I don't think there's a plausible argument that it's not related. It was related to another case in the district in the same courthouse, as a matter of fact, speaking to the fact that Donald Trump should have kept the original case around the documents with the first judge. And then another law professor said it was basically a home run to get Judge Cannon. They clearly made the correct calculation because Judge Cannon's rulings don't make sense. They only make sense if you're trying to help the former president. And she admits that Trump was no doubt judge shopping and continued that they didn't want the magistrate judge to make this decision. There was already a captain of this ship. They just didn't like the direction the captain was taking. And lawyers in the area who didn't want to give their names also found the method of filing the lawsuit curious, which one, with one saying, I don't know anybody who files in person. I didn't even know you could do that anymore. It looks like this person was trying to select a particular judge, while another suggested people who don't, don't do this anymore. It's extremely odd. I guess you could do this if you wanted to get a particular judge or avoid getting a particular judge. And Garland having this info, this new reporting, which again, he has now, is big because all of it helps to situate the inappropriateness of canon. He can use these things, even if only subconsciously, even if only subtextually, in all of his appeals, because he's going forward. And every step of the way now, Garland's current in immediate goal is not just tearing down Donald Trump's BS argument, but going through every level of the court to tear down the BS rulings of canon, whether it was at the Supreme Court, the originally the 11th court, and then back to the 11th circuit to maybe get rid of the special master altogether. And so these are big wins for Garland. In many ways, they're historic wins for the outcome of the case. If you can further build out the conspiracy, if you can locate sympathetic people to the thugs and isolate them, and you can further establish that canon's jurisdiction in this case might have been flawed, if not outright corrupt from the very beginning beginning. Donald Trump filing the documents in person in the wrong space 44 miles away from where he should have. All of these things build a strong case for Garland. And I think it's getting even stronger, even as the risks surrounding all of this are terrifying.